In the early 1970s, two Brown University professors devised a radical plan for their time. English professor Robert Scholes and computer scientist Andy Van Dam proposed using the university's mainframe computer to teach a course not in physics, engineering, or computer science, but in poetry. The course was organized to create new ways for students to interact with texts, with their instructors, and with each other. Sections of the poem were marked by descriptive tags or hyperlinks as we know them today. Students could select these links to find critical reviews, related poems, or other supplementary and contextualizing materials. Students could also add their own commentaries into the system, all of which would be available to their professors and classmates through new links from the central poem. From its inception, this system was designed to enable its users to be both readers and writers, as well as consumers and authors. In many ways, 45 years later, meaning today, digital scholarship is still trying to duplicate, refine, and build on these attempts to interact with content and to create and share new knowledge in collaboration with others. Out of this and other pioneering initiatives at Brown, the Scholarly Technology Group was formed in 1994 as part of the university's central IT services. The group supported the development and use of advanced information technology in academic research, teaching, and scholarly communication. STG, as it was known, pursued this mission for over a decade by exploring new technologies and practices, developing specialized tools and techniques, and providing consulting and project management services to academic projects. These are the very things that we are talking about today in this conference. Though there were periods when several full-time staff were hired on hard and soft money, meaning grant money, the work of STG was not sufficiently integrated into the infrastructure or embedded into the basic service model of central IT. STG was seen as something extra or special, but with limited ongoing support and even more limited blending into the IT organizational structure. As research grant funds diminished and funding from STG was redirected to support other central IT services seen as more essential, the staff and scope of STG services significantly decreased. In 2009, we combined staff from STG with the library's Center for Digital Scholarship Initiatives, along with several subject librarians and other staff into a cross-functional team that we call the Center for Digital Scholarship. Though loosely structured and reporting to different managers and located in several different locations on campus, team members were a great support to each other as well as to faculty and students. One of the first projects that the new CDS group undertook was bringing the Garibaldi panorama to life. Measuring about 4.5 feet in height and more than 260 feet in length, the panorama is a relic from the 1860s, painted on both sides and depicting the Italian unification. 
Italian studies professor Massimo Riva wanted to incorporate the study of this artifact into his research and teaching, and the library agreed to digitize this massive, very fragile, and basically unusable object. Along with Massimo and computer science professor Andy Van Dam, we began to envision a digital research environment that included a multimedia archive built on the Microsoft Surface. This research envi environment provided access to a multimedia archive, an amplified display as seen on the uh, Microsoft Surface. It was very interactive, multi-user, there was mapping and annotations possible, and it connected to our digital repository. But the Microsoft Surface, the Surface at that time was like a tabletop, a small table, not the Surface that you may have uh, as your laptop. The Surface was small, and in order for more than two or three people to see the content, we needed another screen as devised here. In fact, we needed a really big screen, like this one designed for funding purposes. After meeting with many faculty and other technical staff on campus, we realized that we also needed a space in the library dedicated to creating and displaying digital scholarship. This space would be open to everyone and its equipment and software would be easy to use. We drew more designs and wrote more proposals. We found a place in the library for the lab, a place that had been used for serials check-in. And in 2012, we were fortunate to find a donor. The Patrick Ma Digital Scholarship Lab and associated staff are now located in the main humanities and social science library, creating a locus of expertise as well as a physical destination and gathering place on campus. This is the question that I was asked several times this morning. What is the history of building the space at Brown? The DSL, the Digital Scholarship Lab, has been used in research to visualize molecules, to study and compare shards of ancient pottery. It's been used for both traditional and experimental teaching. And the lab has also been used by librarians for workshops and development of their own digital skills and research projects. Equally important has been the lab's use for lectures and presentations by faculty and visiting scholars from across the campus and around the world. As time and experience progressed, we learned that it was not possible for us to anticipate or prescribe the use of the space. We also learned that one space could not serve all purposes. And so we began planning for the production space that we call the digital studio. In the spring of 2016, the studio opened, supporting individuals as well as groups engaged in sustained digital work. The studio is staffed by members of CDS as well as by student workers offering consultation rooms and a small conference room. We also offer audio video production and editing spaces as well as 3D production services, some of which you saw this morning. We host groups collaborating, collaborating together on course assignments and faculty research projects and sometimes students bring projects that have nothing to do with technology, such as the magazine curating and magazine making workshop organized by a student last winter. 
As we assess where we are today, we ask ourselves how can we continue to incrementally move forward, to move forward step by step, shifting from project and place to an actual program, a digital scholarship program, and shifting from individual goals to unit level directions that reflect library-wide priorities and both existing and emerging campus needs. One of the key issues has been to redefine staff vacancies, determining what new services can be added and also how we can strategically extend our partnerships across campus and beyond. I just want to take a few minutes to talk about the partnerships. The Dean of the Faculty, working with faculty directly. CCV is the Center for Computation and Visualization on campus. PSTC is for social science, public social sciences. Computing and information is our central IT. Computer science is the Department of Computer Science. Modern culture and media, many departments and also technology services on campus. We created a director of CDS position. This position was filled just about two months ago and decided that this important role would be included in the senior library leadership team by mainstreaming CDS into the library's organizational structure and institutionalizing the work of CDS as an integral part of library services, we believe there is a better chance for long-term sustainability and impact. And I just want to reference the earlier part of my talk where I mentioned the scholarly technology group formed in the 1990s. That group was not sustainable because it was not embedded deeply into the structure and the priorities of central IT. We are taking more proactive steps to encourage the involvement of other staff within the library who are highly skilled in the analog world of scholarship. I've talked to several of you today about the importance of not just being interested in digital library staff, but being interested in the work and the contributions of all library staff. Our goal is to help these staff expand their capabilities by building new skills and working alongside CDS colleagues in response to today's participatory digital culture, a culture that is eager to not only search and find content, but also to consume, produce, and interact with media in all of its forms. As the library broadens its involvement across all phases of teaching, research, and learning, we are taking a more active role in working with students and faculty as they explore new ways of conducting research and engaging in scholarly activities. As the boundary of what counts as scholarship changes, both before and after publications, one of the most important services developed by the library is the Brown Digital Repository. The repository enables us to cite research projects. This is a, an interesting uh, example because um, a student published this paper but was not able to include the documentation, the, the video documentation. 
And so the library was able to provide a DOI, a digital object identifier, a stable location that could be included in the publication materials. We also disseminate unpublished code and data. This is an example of an interactive uh, visual that the publisher was not willing to publish because they were afraid that the uh, technology might not uh, sustain, be sustainable over time. And so again, the library published this um, graph, this chart, this interactive graph and chart. We also use the repository to archive class projects. In this case, the projects are science cartoons uh, developed to engage STEM and non-STEM students and faculty in the creation of science animations. These are very interesting things that are now part of the scholarly record at Brown. We provide access to faculty publications as well as PhD and master's thesis and more recently, undergraduate honors and senior thesis. Again, every concentration program at Brown allows its students to pursue honors programs. Established in 2016, this collection of undergraduate work contains senior thesis, senior capstone projects, and senior honors thesis that students have chosen to make available through the digital repository. As our work with scientific and humanities research has increased, the library is being recognized across campus as having a new role and a more prominent place at the table. For example, we have been invited to work with academic and administrative offices to review and establish policies for access, reuse, retention, and dissemination of Brown's scholarly assets. One important example here is when faculty leave the university, they believe that all of their digital work, all of their scholarship that they've done at Brown belongs to them, but the university claims ownership of this. And so to make sure that we retain a copy of their research and uh, anything else that they've created, the repository is very helpful. The Digital Initiatives Grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation has enabled the library to focus more on supporting Brown faculty as we jointly produce interactive digital monographs that explore new forms of rhetoric and new forms of dissemination. The grant helps us chip away at today's log jams that have prevented progress in new modes and methods of scholarship and publication. These log jams have limited the ways in which scholarship is read, reused, shared, and preserved. And libraries and barriers that have prevented us from considering and creating new approaches to tenure and promotion practices. This, again, is the cycle of scholarly communication. And I think these are the very reasons that digital scholarship exists and the work of libraries is so important. We recognize that throughout history, various attempts to change the forms and channels of scholarly communication have not always been met with open arms. Here we see from many years ago, looking at 
a manuscript, nice, the scholar says, but as long as there are readers, there will be scrolls, right? So things have changed over time. Sometimes it's hard for people to accept change. Yet today's students and faculty around the globe need to read, write, and think in this digital age. And my message is that libraries can and must help with this. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Is that true? Yes. Any question? It's been a long day. You've been very attentive to all of these things. Yes. Uh, Rosanna Cantavella, University of Valencia. Thank you so much for such an illuminating talk. I was particularly interested in how Brown deals with uh, copyright problems, especially if you could uh, elaborate a bit on the question of who owns um, our research, whether the researcher or the institution, and uh, whether you uh, our advocate for uh, Creative Commons licenses, for example, and uh, open science and open access. Thank you. So that's a big question altogether, but let's uh, take it apart. Um, first of all, uh, questions around copyright, if we want to talk about copyright, the reuse of materials that have been copyrighted. Uh, Brown deals with this as all other universities do. In other words, there are laws uh, about reuse of copyrighted materials. Now the question about who in the university community owns the research, that we often refer to as intellectual property. Who owns the intellectual a property of if I am a faculty member and I create research. This is what I was uh, mentioning earlier. At Brown, the university owns the research property. It does not mean that faculty cannot publish this and have a copyright on the paper or the book that they write. But as a faculty member, a researcher, if I leave Brown, the university owns my data, my research, especially scientific data. So that's, that's a question uh, that is uh, handled somewhat differently depending on the kind of university that uh, you're in. So um, I don't know how it is here, but copyright and intellectual property we think of in kind of two different, different ways. Was there more to your question? Yes. So Creative Commons uh, it is uh, used uh, freely uh, uh, by choice, uh, uh, by faculty, by students. Uh, if they put things in the repository or if they share their information or their uh, research online, they can include a Creative Commons license. Uh, they're not required to do that. Um, but of course, we think that is very good because it allows greater use and reuse of materials. Yes. Other questions? Maybe you need some more tea and... Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.